Good morning and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be doing a inspection on this hive, a brood inspection, which means taking off this top box and having a look at the babies downstairs. Now, it's a beautiful day, which is when you want to be doing brood inspections if you can. You can't always order a beautiful day when it's time to do your brood inspections, but today it's absolutely perfect. We've got a sunny day, not much wind, the bees are happy, and it's time to look in and see what's going on with this hive. The numbers are a bit low compared to other hives, so we want to get in there and check if there's any disease issues or what's going on in the brood box below. Okay, so I'm just going to blow a bit of smoke in the entrance. Now, you really should have your bee veil on at this point if you're standing in front of the beehive. So I'll put that on and just making sure that the middle zip's done up and that then the two side zips have done up. Bring them around. And then the Velcro at the front. Okay, so next I'm going to take the, the roof right off the hive and using a, uh, first of all, a little bit more smoke, I think. We'll smoke in the entrance like this. A couple of good puffs right in there. The smoke is not really going that well yet, so if I give it a few good puffs like this, it'll start to fire up. There we go, that's a bit better. So why are you smoking your hands? Adding a little smoke on the hands to mask my own pheromone because I'm a mammal coming into a hive like a bear in a way and um, I don't want to smell like one to the bees is the theory. So a little bit of smoke on the hands might um, limit uh, stings. Now I don't really need to pull the, the top off, I can just move straight to pulling the uh, honey super off which is this top box so what I'm going to do is get around to each corner and just with this tool just loosen it up now we haven't inspected this one for a little while so it'll be interesting to see how easy it comes off so we're getting some movement there looks like the excluder wants to come with the box so we'll take the excluder with it so what I'm going to do is just put it right in front of the hive. Okay, that's loosened up. Just taken the cover off. Now, there's a good uh, handle at the back if you take this. Thanks, Mira, my sister's here joining us for this brood inspection. She'll be doing some macro bees for you as well. And also take these windows off. That makes a good handle as well. Okay, loosen up that corner for me. Now typically what can happen is the brood frames can come with it, so. Yep, they are. At that point, you sometimes need to lever them back down. We might need to try and actually keep the excluder, I reckon. Might be a good idea. Try. Oh, they're all stuck. Okay, the bees sometimes get a bit annoyed when the brood frames come up with it, but if you haven't inspected in a while, like this one, and they can be a bit stuck to the excluder. There we go. There we go. They did lift a little bit, but not too bad. So, there's a bit of weight in this box. What I'm going to do is put it right in front on its end so I don't squash those bees at the back there. Now we're looking in. Wow, I can see a bee with beautiful uh, orange pollen. I oh, it's just gone and hid. Come back up but here. See, um, here it is. Oh, there it is. Look at that. Beautiful orange pollen balls on the back. Back of the legs there. I don't know if you can see that. It's just decided to have a little drink of some of the honey that's broken in this comb on top of the uh, frames there. But straight away it's interesting to look in and just look what's going on in your hive. Noticing a lot of bees licking up the honey that spilled. It's amazing how quickly they can lick up spills of honey. And I'm seeing quite a lot of honey in the centre, which is interesting. So I'm interested to know how much brood is in the centre of the hive. 
You might even find there's none at all. Let's just have a look and see. Another thing you can do is add a little bit of smoke at this point to keep your smoker going, but also just to calm them down a little bit if they need it. Okay, and a good idea to put your smoker back, just ticking away where the bees are flying in to the hive. There we go. So now I'm gonna look for a frame that's easy to get out for the first frame. So I'm gonna pick this middle one right here. I'm gonna go sideways first with my J-Hive tool between the end bars just to loosen it up. That's it. So that should now come up easily enough just by hooking the J under the end. I can grab that with my hand. Wear your gloves if you need a beekeeping. And and just slowly, slowly coming up. Oh yeah, we have brood. Okay, good. So we have brood. Now I'm just having a look at that brood pattern and just checking to see if, if it looks normal. Now I'm seeing a lot of young ones down the cells here, which is great, in their larvae stage. They spend about 11 days in their larvae stage, the worker bees, and then about 11 days in their cocoon phase, like a caterpillar. They spin a silk cocoon around themselves. And then come day 21 or so, they uh, chew their way out. And if we look really closely, we might even see a bee chewing its way out of its cocoon. drone on the other side actually. Okay, so my sister's just pointing out there's drone brood. These are, no, actual drones. Okay, there's a drone. Drones are good ones to, to grab because they don't have stingers, so they won't actually sting you. Now, um, here we go. He's got real big eyes that meet in the middle. In fact, I don't know if I can do a macro of this drone. So the difference between a drone and a worker, it's quite easy to uh, tell in the end because the drones are a bigger sort of teddy bear shaped compared to the other ones and they've got eyes that are bigger and meet in the middle. There's another one just here running around so you can see the difference between the drones. So drone, worker. Here's another one, drone, worker. People mistake them for queens when they're just getting started, but the queen looks quite different. She's like an, an enlarged worker bee with a nice pointy abdomen. Here's another drone. So if you've got questions, put them in the comments and Trace will read them out as we go, as we do this brood inspection. It's all about just helping answer questions. So if you've got answers to other people's questions, then chime in as well. It's wonderful how the community helps each other get started in beekeeping. Okay. Beautiful. So we've got a uh, shelf brackets doubling as a, as a frame rest here. So you can just rest that down there and it gives you a, a spot to put a couple of frames. I usually just keep it on the high points, and um, that way uh, you can fit a few frames there like that. If you put that one over there, then you can put another one there and another one there. Okay, so let's pull out another frame and have a look what's going on. So far it's looking healthy, just a bit low on numbers. Perhaps they're responding to not much nectar at the moment. Okay, so here we have uh, an older comb. Notice the way it's quite dark. So this has been used a lot for broods. So it's been through multiple seasons and the comb itself shows that because of how dark it's getting. So when you get the older, darker ones, it's a good idea to cycle them towards the edge of the hive so that they can be cycled out when the broods all emerged. 
So queen seed. Here we go. Mira's <laughs> spotted the queen. It's got a blue dot on it. So see if you can see a bee. It's the queen. Here it is. Just in front of my finger there. So notice how her abdomen is pointing way beyond where her wings are, unlike the worker bees. She's also got bigger legs. And where the blue dot is, is usually a shiny black um, thorax plate. And that's one way to, to spot her as well. Because she lives a long time, she wears the hairs off. And that's why that back plate is shiny compared to the other bees. And her movements are different. The other bees are kind of jittery compared to the queen, which struts and strides a bit more. So often the, the way she moves will help you find her. In this case, somebody's put a nice blue dot, which makes it easy to find her. That means she's from last year, I think. And it also means uh, that it's color coded for the year. So queen breeders will color code their dots and change it each year of how old your queen is in your hive. Any questions coming in? Yeah, Cedar. One of the ones was with the um, with the, the dot on that queen. Has that got to do with the the age of the queen? Well, it's the a, a dot that's been marked by a beekeeper, which helps you determine the age because blue, I believe, was last year's colour. Or, or the maybe the year before. So that colour coding helps you uh, determine how old your, your, your queens are if indeed you're buying them in from a queen breeder who's marking them or whether they've been replaced by, by another queen for the colony. So it gives you a bit of, a dart, a bit of data to, to help you work out what's going on. So here we have some emerging bees on this frame, just near the queen. Let's see if, so if we can get a good angle on that. See if you can see that. Might just move it over here. Got Callum behind the camera this morning. Okay. Uh, chat girl. Let's see if <laughs> there you go. There we go. We've got some. She's chewing her way out. Beautiful. Soon will be a young bee or fluffy. They look what? so cute and fluffy. They kind of look like they've got bed hair when they wake when they get up out of their cells. <laughs> See if we can find a new one. Oh, there she comes. Quick, quick. Film that. Macro? Yeah. yeah. Can you see that on, on camera? Give us a thumbs up if it's coming up okay in the image. There she comes. Oh, there she is. How often they take a bit longer than that. That one's rearing. She's like a bit stuck. She's like, come on. And there she goes. See, she looks all fluffy and white. <laughs> Where is she gone? Just there she is. There. So let's see, what's the first few steps in the world going to be for this bee? It's smaller than the other bees. She hasn't done uh, any eating for 11 days since she was a grub. So. Like she's just grooming and getting used to the, there she is. One of the first roles they do actually is they clean. They clean the cells that they've hatched out of and other, other cells, getting them ready for new eggs. Just like my prodigy, one of the first things they do is <laughs> clean the house all the time, you know? <laughs> you wish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bees are a little more organised than my household. Um, <laughs> they've, they've got all of these roles and they move through them in their life. So as Mira was saying, they start off cleaning cells and then they'll, they'll move on to feeding the young larvae down the cells. So you see the glistening white larvae down the cells, they'll actually be feeding them. And the, at first, when they just hatch out of their egg, they'll be feeding them royal jelly, which they secrete from, from their bodies. And then what they'll do on day about three is feed them uh, plant proteins, so bee bread, so you can see here, there's all this beautiful bee bread they've made. They've got pollen, they've fermented it down the cells and they've, they've done their beautiful sourdough thing and made bee bread. So it's a bit easier for them to digest if it's a proper sourdough. And uh, they'll feed that to the young larvae and that'll turn them into a worker bee. If they kept feeding them royal jelly, then 
they would become a queen. So that way they can choose whether to turn a bee into a queen or not. It's quite cool. Very cool. Cedar, one of the questions is coming in then, like, you know, when cows are born and they learn to walk and all well, of that, how do laying, babies... Oh, God, it's all happening here. Queen's laying down the cell. Oh, the queen's laying. <laughs> oh, she's looking at, looking at another one. Looking at another cell. So she, she sticks her head down the cell and she actually uses There she the, goes. Oh, here she goes, she's laying. So she sticks her head down first and her antenna senses the size of the cell, which then she decides either to... She's got, oh, she's got an egg hanging out. Oh, just <laughs> dropped off. She dropped the egg. She dropped oh, the egg. No. Ladies and gentlemen, it's all happening here. She didn't quite, she didn't quite get it in the right place, lady. Oh, oh dear. <laughs> Uh, maybe maybe well, she's, 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 she's probably a bit camera shy. There she goes oh, there again. She goes again. Laying. Yeah, yeah. She's a pretty, paparazzi on the queen. She's not very camera shy. She's laying away, which is unusual. Oh, yep, she got that one out. Okay, I wonder if you can get a closer image of what's going on here. Look at that. There she goes again. She's just in front of the okay. hive tool here. There she goes, laying again. Look at that. So, yeah, so her antenna tell her that it's the size of a worker or a drone cell and so she either lays a fertilized egg or there she goes again or an unfertilized egg so the fertilized eggs are worker bees and the unfertilized eggs are drones wow very cool very very cool often they don't lay because they're Sorry, Trace, we got a little distracted oh, yeah. there. Oh, no, that was, that was exciting. Lane queen, you know, oh, it was look, all having, happening. Having Cedar and Mira up doing this is just like watching some full-on operation. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, the ultimate. So that was exciting. That, that question again. That was the question. Now, the question, oh, yes, the question was, okay, once the little baby bee's been born, how does it learn to start flying and then go out foraging? Like, do they have training wheels? or? Well, they do what's called an orientation flight first. So often it gets confused for swarming where you've got this situation where perhaps the sun's come out for the first time in a little while and you get this big cloud of bees just buzzing aimlessly around the hive and that'll be a whole lot of baby bees that have been waiting for a, a good chance to test their wings out for the first time. So what happens is they, they, they fly out for their first flight and they'll just circle around just kind of aimlessly like this in the air and come back again and they'll keep doing that and what they're doing is starting to, to take in uh, bearings of the landscape so that they know their way home and that's their first bit of practice on their training wheels as you say. And hope they don't get lost coming home. Yeah. Now, See, she's run over the other side by the looks of it. Okay, where is she? There she is. You want to... Uh, well, I thought maybe put that one back in if, you, if she's on there. You don't want to hang her. No, no, but do you want to get any more footage? There oh, she is. never say no. <laughs> 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 it's the filming days. Okay, go again, Trace. Great, okay. Eric's in the northeast USA, very cold winters. Just wondering, should they be using two brood boxes? Okay, it's a good question. If you've got experience from that region please help to chime in it's often good to get local advice here i just like to keep it one brood box a bit easier to manage whereas it, in cold places as you say it is common to have a, either a second brood box or a second honey super uh, so you've got a few more stores for the cold winter the long cold winter so if you're in a place with long cold winters find out about how much honey stores you need in your hive to survive the long cold winter. And ask a few different beekeepers because you'll get different answers as well and people managing bees in different ways and see what works for you. 
Great. See, the Gary's asking, new beekeeper and has just infer, um, installed a new package of bees. Got an eight frame Flow Hive 2 Plus, um, installed them about three weeks ago. He's planning to put a medium super on so that the bees have got some honey um, before he adds the flow super. And he's just wondering at what point does he know they're ready um, to add the honey super? Is it based on how many frames they have drawn or the volume of bees in the brood box? So it's both, right? So you, you want to make sure the frames are all drawn out like this and that you're seeing lots of bees when you open the lid. Those two things together mean it's time to add your honey super. Now, you can do what you said and add a, a medium first, but what that'll mean is you'll be waiting a lot longer to get the flow frames filled up. So what I usually recommend is people start with uh, their configuration like this, where you've just got the brood box and the honey super on top wait till they get a bit of traction on the flow frames before adding more boxes. Otherwise it'll just be a long time and you might get impatient with your flow frames. <laughs> so Em's asking what percentage of brood is usually drone brood? Okay so in a hive of yeah, up to 50,000 bees you might get about 600 drones uh, at any one time. That ebbs and flows, it changes with the seasons. In the springtime you get a lot more drones being made the hive wants to spread its genetics around and uh, yeah so that's that's about the ratio however some hives will just have uh, uh, you know thousands of drones for whatever reason it's just genetics uh, playing out and other hives might not ha have as many at all but really mostly workers handful of drones and one queen sometimes two queens <laughs> I think she's run across the other side again. Oh. Maybe we should put her back in and see what the next frame's like. Yes. On that queen, if, I think she's if she fell off that herself. frame and didn't end up in the box, would she find her way back home? Possibly not. So that's the reason why we're holding this frame above the brood nest as we're playing around here. We, we want to make sure the queen's in the hive, not outside the hive. You can get into a situation where she's dropped on the ground and doesn't work her way back. Most of the time, she, I mean, all the bee books say she can't fly when she's in egg laying mode, but we definitely see them fly. It's not true. It's not, it's <laughs> I've, I've, had two, <laughs> I've had two separate queens fly whilst in full egg laying mode. One flew off and never came back. And, yeah. She just ran up the frame onto the top and just took off. And I was like, um. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> You've got a job to do. Yeah, and she was like, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, I see. Is she hiding somewhere? But nevertheless, it's a good idea to keep your queen in the box if you can and not drop her on the ground. She might get stood on, anything. Um, We've got more emerging bees on the other side. I think the queen's run off this frame now. You think she dropped off? I, th I think as we had it down here, she's run she off. Ran yeah, so let's put this one down. We've got, we've got one frame out there, and that's enough really to give you space to manipulate the hive. So they, you can put more here if you want to, but try not to put the one with the queen on it yeah. uh, outside like that. <laughs> Does the queen ever lay more than one egg in the cell? Yes, that can happen. Typically, when they're first getting started, they're a bit trigger happy and they're just like laying eggs multiple per cell and that's not really the best thing um, so uh, but they usually eventually get it together but sometimes you've got multi queen layers but um, <laughs> multi egg layer multi queens egg layers. yeah some people some people see a couple of eggs in a cell and assume oh my god it's laying workers and there isn't a queen but like Cedar was saying they they do um, sometimes as new queens just you know it takes a little while for them to get their groove and they might do a double or a triple egg in a cell whereas laying workers when there isn't a queen the, the workers will start to lay but they can only lay drones and you'll see I had a hive in the apiary just this week that had laying workers and so it's multiple workers laying multiple eggs and usually it's like five or eight eggs in a cell kind of all scattered around in there um, so they're two different things and they often get confused. Yeah. So it's good to, you know, sort of learn, learn to um, spot the difference essentially. Typically when it's laying workers, they're laying them not down the bottom of the cell because they're, they're 
can't reach that far. They don't have a long pointy bum like the queen, right? So, so um, if you find them halfway down the walls and you know a couple per cell, it's probably laying workers because they're desperate to try and get something happening because there's no queen. Well, <laughs> like every beekeeper, there's lots of disagreements. And here's a photo <laughs> of my colony from this week. Let me see if we can show it on the screen. And you'll see that all the eggs are at the bottom of the cell seeds. But was that laying workers? That was laying workers. Oh, that's an impressive and photo. twice I've seen this and the eggs aren't on the sides. They're in the bottom. There you go. So Maybe it's in the drone cells they can't get to the bottom, but in the worker cells they can. Hmm. There you go. Oh. So the beekeeping's full of <laughs> things that may or may not be true <laughs> in, in your situation. And we've started a bit of myth busting. One with this hive behind me here, we did the banana skins. Have a look at that. It's called myth busting. Uh, does the banana thing work? And we found that it didn't. So even though lots of beekeepers swear that putting bananas in hives get rid of chalk brood, it actually made it worse in this particular case. Oh, interesting. Yeah, there's lots of, they say for every two beekeepers, you get three different opinions. And um, <laughs> it's definitely true. <laughs> um, and I think one of the amazing things about being a beekeeper is that you're constantly learning from the bees. And the main thing is that I'm right and they're wrong, <laughs> right? So, you know. <laughs> no, I'm right. No, I'm wrong. <laughs> uh, Sibling rivalry. Yes. <laughs> Good. Jackie wants to know what would be a sign that the hive is not healthy or needs attention. Okay, so if, if we were seeing not much brood in here or if we were seeing chalk brood, um, like I was, uh, like if you look up the banana th uh, thing experiments, you'll see what chalk brood looks like. But what we're looking out for is they've turned this into honey, so we can move towards the edge. So this might be a good one to cycle out because the, the wax is very old and dark. Yeah. Um, but what you're looking for is brood that's probably a bit patchy in fashion, a bit sunken and perhaps with piercing in the cappings. And you're always on the lookout for that because that's a really bad disease called AFB. And uh, that one you actually have to destroy your colony for in most countries. Uh, so um, that's uh, something that you're always on the lookout for just in case it turns up. Hopefully it ne never does for you but look up AFB but, and you'll be able to see what that looks like. Yeah, and so when you're in your hive and you're doing an inspection, you would like to see all stages of brood. So you want eggs, you want young larvae, then you want capped brood, and then worker bees filling the frames. You also, it's a good, like you see the kind of really fluffy ones, like they've just been some that have emerged. So you've got a good balance of like nurse bees and foragers. Um, and you know, you like to see a decent amount of brood, but yeah, that's what I always look for. If I see that my colony has brood in all stages, it means that there hasn't been, you know, some kind of issue going on. Yeah, so the main thing you're looking for is that, that there's a queen laying, you're seeing, you're seeing young grubs down cells and brood, and then you know your, your hive's pretty well happy and healthy, and then you just keep a look out in, while in case some of the disease issues show up but yeah. otherwise just let it build up from there. And while it's fun to spot your queen it's not actually essential if you can learn to see the eggs which are quite hard to see at first They're like a little tiny miniature grain of rice at the bottom of the cell but once you can spot eggs then you actually don't need to find the queen because you know that she's been there within three days. Have a look at this this is quite interesting. What you've got here is worker sized cells around this region, which they are using for worker brood, which you can see here. But just over here, you've got drone size. Look how much bigger all of these cells are. So that's drone size cells, just, up, you know, just above six millimeters in size, whereas these ones are 5.3 millimeters. And after a little while, you can really yeah, tell the difference between the two sizings. So this frame, if it was put in the middle of the brood nest, would tend to encourage a lot more drones. In this case, they're using it mainly for honey storage. They like to do bigger cells for honey storage when they're away from the brood nest, and that's why the flow frames are a bit of a bigger cell size too. Fantastic. Cedar, um, 
Oh, what was I saying? Oh, okay. With the, you were talking about the flow um, brood inspections, are there rules and regulations in regards to how often you should inspect or what would you recommend people um, opening up their hives? So the rules and regulations in Australia say that your hive does have to be serviceable. You can't just keep bees in a garbage bin or a milk bottle. The, um, the, the frames have to be serviceable for you to inspect for pests and diseases. And typically you need to go through your brood nest like this a couple of times a year, just checking for issues such as AFB and make sure that's not present. And the rest of the time it's more just an as needed operation here in Australia where you're, if you notice the numbers dropping you might get in there and inspect to see perhaps there's chalk brood or perhaps they've lost their queen or perhaps they've swarmed and they're building back up again. And uh, you're just getting in there to, to check what's going on when you notice an issue. Other continents have the varroa mite, which has all sorts of management practices that vary depending on what strategies you're using, and it might mean a lot more intervention uh, during the, um, the, the spring season. Okay, but I don't know much about the varroa mite because luckily we don't have it here in Australia. Mira's has done some beekeeping with varroa mites in yeah, Berlin. I did about three seasons in Berlin, um, so I had varroa mite and winter to deal with. Um, and I'm very glad that I'm back keeping bees without varroa mites. It's quite, um, there's a lot that you have to do to manage the numbers of mites in the colony. Um, there's various methods of treating. Um, but yeah, it's definitely um, adds a bit of challenge that I'm glad not to have back in, in Australia. So these are all naturally drawn combs. We're just letting the bees go free form, but we're giving them a frame and a bit of a guide to hopefully go in straight lines so that we can inspect them. But look at this comb, it's quite interesting what's going on. They've got holes running through it, something that you don't see if you're using a plastic foundation sheet. Does that only mean that there's a problem for having that hole in that brood frame? No, no, it means the, the hive's holy. <laughs> Dad joke. <laughs> uh, um, it just means the bees, you know, that they've gone, okay, here's the road we want to take and oh. they've just done it. I don't, I don't see any issue with... Put in a roundabout or something. Yeah. Put in a roundabout, yeah. They, they just do what they need. So what I'm going to do is shuffle these frames around a little bit because this one that I was holding up previously it's getting a little dark and old and I think what we'll do is put that near the edge. There's a little bit of brood on that to, to emerge and then we'll chop that comb out and that'll give them a fresh start. And it's always good to have a fresh start. Nice thing to do in the springtime to give the uh, queen new pasture to lay on and then that hive will be less likely to swarm. Mm, yeah, and in, important to also, yeah, to cycle out that old dark comb. It's important when you are shuffling frames around to make sure that there's not a, a bulgy bit of comb touching another bulgy bit of comb from the other frame. If there is, that's where hive beetles might decide to, to lay their eggs because the bees won't be able to service that until they chew that area away. So I'm just keeping a lookout for that as I'm shuffling frames here. And typically when you inspect a colony, unless you're doing this for the reason that's swapping those over, you wouldn't reorganise the brood nest. You'd, you pull it out and you put it back in the same way because the bees have sort of carefully managed that, especially um, with the honey frame that Cedar swapped out to the edge to, to um, just have like a tiny bit of cat brood. So that was fine to put out there, but usually you try and keep the brood nest together as well. I'm just decided to do a little tidying. It's a bit of um, <laughs> clean up up to the uh, beekeeper here whether you do that or not, but basically it'll mean the excluder will be less stuck next to top of these top bars. And um, you also get a ball of wax to play with, make a candle out of. <laughs> so Gary's asking, had a package in for 10 days and seeing lots of nectar, pollen, eggs and a few larvae. Is this pretty good progress for a 10 day old package? Absolutely, so 10 days isn't much in the scheme of a a, a beehive, so fantastic you're getting there and seeing what's going on. Oh, great.
it's good, isn't it? And Bill's asking if you supply a simple sugar mixture from day one, when do you stop doing that? How do you know when to stop feeding them? Well, with a package, my experience with feeding... Yeah, like, this was a diff different question, so different. not necessarily the package, okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah. with a package, yes, usually people will feed them, so they build up. Um, but my experience with feeding in terms of winter stores, so before the winter, you make sure you, if your colony is a little bit light, often people will feed sugar. Um, usually, you will feed until the bees stop taking it, or the temperature drops below a certain point. Because once it's below a certain temperature, the bees won't be able to process the liquid sugar water into honey stores. Uh. So they're two different. They're also two different um, sugar syrups. One is to stimulate nectar, like so when your package is growing, you'd be um, stimulating nectar, so you'd be, yeah, you, you're pretending to be nectar, so it's a weaker sugar syrup, and when you're wanting them to store that sugar syrup as honey, it's stronger, it's like two, two to one, sugar to water, whereas the, the spring one is one to one. Ah, okay. One to one sugar, or two, two, to two one. sugar to one. Yeah, two to one. so that's, okay. Yeah, so whether you're wanting them to store in autumn for the winter stores or whether you're wanting to s sort of stimulate the colony to start growing a lane and growing home. Right. Nelly and Jack, they're on the central coast of New South Wales and they did an inspection on Saturday. A little bit of cloud clover, 21 degrees, not a bad day. As soon as they lifted off the lid of the super, the bees started going crazy. They, all, they got stung a few times. Any idea why this hive would become so cranky? Genetics is the is the main thing when it comes to cranky bees. So, if you get uh, genetics where the the queen's mated with some rascal drones from down the road, then those genetic traits will come in, and they might be much more protective. I guess beekeepers breed them to breed out those traits of aggression because it's much nicer for us to to be around the bees when they're less protective. But if you're finding that you, it's hard to manage your colony because they're too aggressive, then what you'll need to do is get in there, and you might need some help to do this if you're getting started in beekeeping, is take her away and a day later introduce a new one with known genetics from a queen breeder. You can often order queens in the mail, and you can order uh, Caucasian queens, Italian queens. Um, sounds interesting, but actually, is what you can do and they come with with five escort bees in a little package and uh, when you introduce that queen to the colony about six weeks later you'll notice the whole temperament's changed. I find a good um, you know bees can also just be having a bad day and so I tend to give a colony you know a couple of goes and if they're consistently aggressive you know, two or three times in a row, then I, th I think it's the genetics. If it's just once a one-off, sometimes it can just be that they're having a bad day. Or you're wearing a perfume that they don't like, or something's going on in the colony that's causing them to be extra aggressive. And can the, can the queen change? Like if you've had a pretty good queen and then all of a sudden she goes cranky, is that still just genetics that something's happened? Or like what you're saying, Mira, it could be other factors that are affecting it? Well, it depends. So, so the, the queen mates with, you know, 20 up to 30 drones. And so she could have, a, there could be a period of time where that particular uh, mixture, you know, that, that semen from that particular drone that was a little bit aggressive could, could come out and then leave. Or that the possibility is that they could have requeened themselves, that the queen could have died and they could have requeened and then, of course, um, where she mates is unknown and that could then become aggressive. That would be my... Yeah, most likely they've changed the queen and, yeah. and the new queen's... Um... Made with some rogue drone. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the bad boys. Oh, oh, we need some mulch. We need uh, some more fuel. More fuel. Oh, Jai's on to that. On your Jai. Hey, my nephew Jai here. I have a question this morning. What sort of backyard do you need to have to keep bees? So the great thing about bees is they take up a small footprint. So my sister Mira actually had them on her balcony in Berlin. So she's a couple of stories up and she's just keeping a few beehives. How many did you have? Oh, I had three at one point, but then I dropped back to two. But it was just a balcony <laughs> about a metre wide and two metres long. So that and about 30 sunflowers and a bunch of pots with flowers for the bees. So 
Wow. It was a lot of fun. So you can keep them in a very small area, which is exciting because you can get real amounts of produce from a very small space, even if you don't have a farm. So for that reason, people do it on their balconies and their roofs and all of that. And uh, it's, it's really a growing thing in urban environments to keep bees and you get beautiful honeys that come in because people plant all sorts of things all around the city and often a really long honey season because of all the things that people are planting. Yeah, there's a great diversity that can happen with urban hives um, that you get so many people's gardens so they actually get, they actually, people think, oh, city hives wouldn't do that well, but actually city bee hives do incredibly well, surprisingly. They do. Where you can also keep them in your backyard in suburbia, a lot of people do that. So you don't necessarily need a, a, a big area or a big farm to, to keep bees and get some produce happening. You can and actually see the different genetics here. We've got a very light coloured bee, this one. It's got very light stripes compared to some of these other ones that have really dark stripes. And so that's just the different fibres, genetics coming through in the bee. This is quite light and then this one's quite dark. Thanks. Thanks, Jai. It's just reloaded the smoky here. Yeah. It's going really nicely. Ready to go. So what we're going to do is start putting this back together as we answer a few last oh. questions here. Great, because they're rolling in. Peter's asking, really dedicated to the foundationless frames, but cross-combing cross -combing is an ongoing issue. Any tips? Okay, so um, it's definitely my preferred method is foundationless because I just don't like going through that wax and wiring process. But it does mean you get cross comb as you say sometimes. Some hives are more cross comby than others. And the, I guess the, the tips are once you get a straight comb, um, move that aside and put one of the ones they haven't drawn out yet in between. So you use the straight frames as guides to draw the next one. And what, then they usually get the idea and follow suit. But uh, if you're having to deal with cross comb on the edge where let's say these two frames uh, um, they, they've started here and they have gone right across onto this frame and then back again then over here again then what I'd tend to do if it was on the edge would be just uh, get them out get all, get all the bees off and um, take, cut the comb out and let them start again um, if, if your frames in the middle of cross comb they've got brood in them then pick up those two frames together and move them to the edge, wait till the broods emerge, and then the same thing, you can then cut that comb out and give them another go. Hopefully next time it'll be straight. I find also like the, the key with foundationless, because I love it also, once I started using foundationless, I've n never gone back, um, is that when, you know, when you're starting a colony, whether it's a package or a swarm, it's really important to really make sure the colony is level, especially from side to side, but also to go in and check them because you can very easily correct it when it's that fresh new comb and there's just a little bit of cross comb going on. Um, so you kind of have to pay a little bit more attention when they're just sort of building up. Yeah, it's a little bit more work in the hive, which I find a lot more fun. Yeah. And less work in the shed waxing and wiring frames, which I find tedious. Me so. too. <laughs> <laughs> but each to their own. Never again. If, if you like um, wax and wiring and you find that enjoyable, then by all means you can do that, which means you'll have to inspect less in the early stage. And it's great for when you want to cycle out comb. So you want to pull out the edge combs full of honey and caps, you pull it out, you cut it onto a tray or into a storage container, and then you can just put that frame straight back in. And keeping in mind the wax and wire was invented for the centrifuging so you need that reinforcement in the wax if you're going to spin it at a high speed in a centrifuge. Some people do spin naturally drawn combs as well but you get more blowouts of comb just flinging against the walls of your extractor. But because we don't need to use an extractor with the flow hive then we also don't need that wire reinforcing in the frame so we can choose to do it in a different way. Great. Andy's, um, sorry, Andy's asking, and it's a question that comes up quite a lot, so I'll ask it again, um, on concerning the timber of the hives, and this is a cedar hive, I think, Ron, just wondering, oils and stains, what, what do you prefer to use on them? You know, this was an oil that soaked in and all but disappeared on this hive, and it definitely doesn't last as long as some of the decking coats. So 
uh, the deck coats will last the longest and that's what I'd recommend if you ask for a long lasting wooden looking finish. Is that where that one went or was it one over? Uh, I think it's okay because it's not touching anything. Just a bit of a gap there you might need to. Uh, let's have a look here. Push this frame over. Let's have a look. Are they too close here? I so what, what we're doing is having a look. There's a bit of a bulge in the comb that might not enough space for the bees to, to work. Sometimes leaving the comb on top, I scraped it all off, but it tells you a bit of a story about how they go back together when you can see the adjoining comb that they've been putting on top here. But in this case, we have, um, uh, we've scraped it off so it's harder to tell which bit goes with what, but as long as the comb parts aren't touching each other, that's the main thing. So I have a method when I beekeep to avoid confusion of what frames what, is that I always start with this frame, unless there's a reason not to. I always start with one frame in, because this one's often braced to the wall. And then I know where I've started and where I go back to. It's just one of those quirks that I do, which I find really useful. <laughs> so that I know where I am. But seed is not as organised as that. <laughs> yeah. No, no. <laughs> Would you ever number them? No. Because is that too confusing when you start mixing? When you start mixing them. Uh. I, did, I did do beekeeping in Germany with someone who had a thumbtack system where he would red, white or yellow thumbtack for different frames depending on whether they had brewed honey or eggs. Oh. But I found that a little too labour intensive. So notice the bees have just gotten a little bit cranky about the setup. You know, they've put up with this with this show and tell for this long, but the tone's changed. Yeah, it was higher pitch. If I get down here, you can hear it. So what I'm going to do before I put this back on is I'm going to add a bit of smoke, and that'll do two things. That'll calm them down, but it'll also get them off the excluder, so we'll squash less bees putting it back together. Could. Callum's doing a great yeah. job first time on camera, right and amongst all these bees. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We've, we've thrown him in the yeah. deep end. So we've got a new uh, filmmaker and we said, here you go, let's do some bee filming. Put on a bee suit and <laughs> off you go. If, if you, Eric's asking if the flow hive doesn't fill up before winter, is it okay to leave it on through winter? I'm not sure where Eric is. So, so you can. It depends a little bit on the, where you are and what you're doing. So if you've got a long cold winter ahead and there's not much honey in there, then I would take that flow frame box off just to allow the bees to have the size of hive that's more suitable to the size of their colony and that, that'll help them keep it warm and so on. <laughs> it's handy. Here we go. Brother, sister team going on here. Okay, now we're just lining it up as best we can. There we go. Hive back together. Sorry for this disturbance here this morning, bees. Nice to look in at your world for a little bit and see what's going on. Always fascinating. Any more questions? Yeah, and of course, as always, Mira, people saying, what is that macro lens you are using? <laughs> always. Always. Um, so I'll show you the macro lens. Where is it? So this is a macro lens from uh, Moment. They do a macro prime lens, and I've just got it on my iPhone. Um, and I use a combination of that plus uh, an iPhone 13 that has a macro lens built in. But I really love this um, little macro lens. It does a great job of getting those super close up shots. And um, that's, that's my big obsession, is chasing bees around with a macro lens and an <laughs> iPhone. <laughs> that's my happy place. Uh, <laughs> nice. 
When's when's a good time to do a split a split on a hive? So the split time is best when you've got an abundance of nectar coming, and that typically is in your springtime when there's a lot of flowers flowering, and the bees are breeding up, and you know there's more flowers coming. Then that's the time to split because it'll give you a split the, the best chance it's got to really build up nicely and turn into a, a full size colony. So uh, you can get other times of year here because we've got an interesting subtropical region where we get good honey in the winter time and so on. We might decide to split really early on even before spring started or we might decide to, to, to split in winter sometimes because we're at a, at a locale on the coast that has an abundance of flowers and we know they're going to go good with a lot of uh, with a lot of flowers so it really just depends on what's going on in your region you're trying to predict what's going on ahead and take that split when you know there's flowers to come great thanks Eda. melinda's in melbourne she has three hives um, and is moving a few streets away just wondering any tips on on her make, basically moving these three hives a couple of streets away so, <laughs> That's a challenging one. yeah, three hives. So, so um, moving beehives is interesting, right? I'll just take this off. A few bees around. It's nice to get out of the the veil. Um, so, moving hives is interesting, right? Because bees will geolocate to the spot. They've got this incredible way of detecting landmarks and. I believe a lot more credi uh, incredible than, than the, the books say. They can even tell accurate information back to the hive about exactly which window to go in the house to find my honey. <laughs> um, so uh, what you're dealing with then when you move your hives is that memory of where the bees know their home is. So if you're moving um, a short distance, then if you just pick up the hives and move them, Sorry, one sec. <coughs> if you just pick up the hives and move them, then a lot of the bees will go back to the old spot and ball up there on a bush or whatever. So what you need to do is actually uh, use a tactic of move, moving them further away till those bees have cycled through because the worker bees only last four to six weeks and then move them to the new locale or use what we do is is use what's called a distraction technique where we actually um, put something in front of the entrance and what that does is it makes the bees who are coming out foraging really um, uh, it causes them to reorientate because all of a sudden there's something different in front so you can you can put a t-shirt or something taped around the hive or or pick a whole lot of foliage and put it in front of the hive that wasn't there before and your bees will come flying out and bang into it and go, what's different? And then instead of having 50% of the bees go back to the old spot, you get 5% of the bees returning back to the old spot. So a really useful technique if you do want to move your bees a short distance, less than, um, less than that sort of four mile, six kilometre kind of range. So that's the one we mainly use if we're moving a short distance. But you will get some bees still returning to the old spot which you can collect in a box and then ferry them over or, you, or if there's other hives in that locale then they'll just go into those other hives so it depends a little bit what's going on. Fantastic, that actually Rhonda's got a similar question but moved the hive a, um, a couple of nights ago only a small distance. Did the reorientation um, way that you just mentioned there, Cedar, but noticing there's about 50 bees going back to the original position, she's just wondering will they end up finding their hive or would they perish? Or as you mentioned, you'd go and collect them. Is that if there's no hive for them to go into, they'll, they'll eventually will fade out without a colony. So if you do want to ferry them, you can, use, you can just put a cardboard box there where the old hive was, make a bit of a hole in it, and they'll go in there and um, you can ferry them across to where the hive has been moved to. Fantastic. When you were talking about that queen laying um, a few, putting a few extra eggs and Naomi's asking, will those multiple eggs develop? That's a good question. Have, have you seen what happens? Usually I would say um, what I've seen is that the workers will remove one of those eggs or one of those grubs. Usually when that's happening, if you look at the larvae developing, 
you don't see multiple larvae developing in a cell, you just see one. So I reckon the worker bees must get in there and sort that out. So, one egg gets turfed. Yep, yeah, I reckon. So it's, Any, not many, many, many. it's not like your brother's seed, it's not like a couple of twins going on. That's no, right. I've never seen two grubs developing I've, in one cell. I've got, oh yeah, I've got twin brothers and one tried to turf the other one out, but didn't <laughs> manage. <laughs> <laughs> uh. So, just come and have a look at the entrance, because they're doing something that's interesting. If we get down close there, you can see you can see that they're um, they're fanning and they're they're fanning their wings and they're tipping the tail of their abdomen down and they're revealing this what's called the Nazanoff gland and so it's a pheromone that they're fanning into the air because we disturb them with the brood inspection they're telling all the other bees come on this is home come home <laughs> so yeah that's the they sometimes they'll fan at the entrance to reduce the honey content to heat or cool the hive but then they have their butts up but they don't have the tip kind of tilted down and you can actually see if you get the oh, I don't know if I can get the macro lens in there but you can actually see a very small little gland that gets exposed so that's pretty cool they're but like, it look like it looks like they're twerking yeah <laughs> they're not twerking bees twerking bees <laughs> <laughs> this is home Thank you very much for all your great questions and tuning in. Let us know what you'd like us to cover next time. And uh, we're always interested to cover new topics. So if you've got something you want us to cover, then let us know. And thank you for all of those that have been tuning in and helping other people answer all of the amazing questions uh, because that's what it's all about, helping each other learn. So thank you for, for chiming in and don't hesitate to chime in if you've got answers to people's questions. Thanks and see you next week.